Is the mic turned on? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joanne Myers, Director of Public Affairs Program. And on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to welcome our loyal subscribers, those subscribers who have yet to renew, and those who are thinking about becoming one to this Public Affairs Breakfast Program. To mark the beginning of this program year, it is our pleasure to host the renowned political scientist and public intellectual Frank Fukuyama. Beginning with his legendary essay, The End of History, Professor Fukuyama's writings on the state of the international order have proven prescient time and time again. In his most recent book, Identity, The Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment, his scholarship in lucid analysis is once again on display as he returns to themes he began to explore in 1992. This book will be available for you to purchase at the end of the hour today. Around the world, identity politics is being blamed for deepening political divisions. From Budapest to Rome, London to Washington, every social, political, and economic debate is colored by identity. Where once differences in background and culture were celebrated as inspiring multiculturalism, our differences feed perceptions of unbridgeable division. Where once immigration was seen as enriching Western societies, it is now considered a cause of distress. Whether it is class, race, ethnicity, gender, or religion, political leaders all over the world are mobilizing their followers around the idea that their dignity has been affronted and must be restored. As Professor Fukuyama writes, identity politics has come to the fore. It has become our common culture, no longer the province of one party or side. It has entrenched both sides of the political spectrum, fueled populist nationalism, authoritarianism, religious conflict, and democratic decline. But what is identity, and what does it mean today? In identity, the demand for dignity and the politics of resentment, Professor Fukuyama addresses this question by providing a historical overview leading to a modern concept of identity. He asks us to consider what he says is a richer understanding of human motivation and behavior. His focus is on what happens when people feel that their dignity is not recognized, publicly claimed, or acknowledged by the political system, all necessary elements for a thriving democracy. There is no doubt that the demand for recognition of one's identity is a master concept that unifies much of what is going on in world politics today. As identity claims continue to polarize democratic societies to the point of no return, the defining question is, is there a way out? For guidance, please join me in welcoming the person who is often called the soothsayer of our age, Frank Fukuyama, welcome back to the Carnegie Council. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joanne. So I stop here at the Carnegie Council every single time I do a book tour, and I'm really grateful for you hosting me. It's been a great audience, and uh, I look forward to our discussion. So uh, the reason that I wrote this book uh, really had to do with the elections of 2016 that brought Donald Trump to office and Britain out of the European Union, uh, the rise of global populism uh, is, in my view, the single biggest threat to global democracy. Now, of course, you've got authoritarian countries like Russia and China that pose a much more traditional uh, geopolitical threat. But I think the surprising thing that's emerged is within established uh, liberal democracies, beginning with the United States, you had this upwelling of a kind of populist uh, movement that really threatens the liberal part of liberal democracy in which you have uh, democratically elected leaders like Viktor Orban or Law and Justice Party in Poland, Erdogan in Turkey, uh, and I would say our President Donald Trump in the United States who are uh, intrinsically anti-institutional. They claim to represent the people uh, out there and therefore if institutions like um, you know, the courts or a justice ministry or the media get in their way, they uh, attack them uh, and try to undermine the institutional basis. This has gone very far in both Poland and Hungary where both um, uh, judicial systems have been pretty much stripped of their independence since those populist parties came to power. And obviously something uh, comparable that, to that is playing out in the United States. So the question is, what's driving uh, all of this? You know, most recent example, the election last Sunday in Sweden, where uh, 
Sweden Democrats, another anti-immigrant populist party, came in third. 17% of the uh, votes are the third uh, uh, party now in the Swedish uh, parliament. So the, there's a usual um, explanation, which is economic, that has to do with globalization, the fact that globalization made everybody richer in the aggregate, but that middle classes in the developed world have been losing uh, ground. A lot of jobs have been going to China and Bangladesh and other uh, parts of the developing world. Uh, I don't deny that this is an important trigger for what's been happening. There's clearly been this period of, I would say, excessive enthusiasm for certain kinds of neoliberal policies that have accelerated uh, this kind of economic decline in developed countries. But I think that people tend to underestimate what I would call the cultural uh, dimension of this, which is the identity dimension, all right? So as a psychological phenomenon, I spend the first third of the book really talking about the origins of the modern concept of identity because I have a very specific uh, definition of it. So we have an identity that's written onto our licenses. You know, uh, That's not what I mean. Identity, I think, begins with a psychological phenomenon that Plato labeled thumos. It's a Greek word that is usually translated as spiritedness, but it's the part of the human psychology that the economists just don't get. You know, they get acquisitiveness and they get rationality, but the but thumos is this desire for other people to recognize your internal worth or dignity. And I think it's a universal uh, characteristic, particularly when you feel that you've got an inner self that is not being adequately recognized by the surrounding society. And that's the part of it that in Western thought has developed over the last several hundred years into the way that we think about ourselves. We think that we have a deeply buried inner self that is authentic and is somehow being suppressed by the society around us. And unlike wayward teenagers from time immemorial that are brought into compliance with the outward society, the modern idea is that actually that inner self is the, is the true legitimate one and it's the outer society that's false and it's the outer society uh, that needs to change. And this becomes the basis for a lot of political movements because we want recognition, we want public recognition, we want other people to affirm our worth, and that has to be a political act, right? And so there's lots of manifestations of this, uh, beginning with, I think, democracy itself. So if you think back to 2011, the beginning of the Arab Spring, Mohammed Bouazizi, this vegetable seller in Tunis, had his cart confiscated by the police. He tried to go to the governorate and said, where's my cart? Can I have it back? They wouldn't listen to him. He got so uh, to a point of such despair that he doused himself with gasoline, set himself on fire. And that was the trigger for the Arab Spring because this was a very recognizable act of denying someone's basic humanity. You know, you don't think that this person, this citizen of your country is worth even uh, responding to when you take away his livelihood. And this is, you know, it was a very familiar thing. This is the problem with authoritarian governments. Authoritarian governments do not treat their citizens as full human beings with agency, with voice, as people that they have to respect. And I think that, you know, so obviously the Arab Spring went very wrong after that point. But I think that opposition to this lack of dignity was at the base of those protests. In Ukraine in 2013-14, you actually had an uprising that the Ukrainians themselves, the young Ukrainians, labeled the revolution of dignity against Viktor Yanukovych, this kleptocrat, friend of uh, Putin's that was trying to drag Ukraine back into the Russian uh, orbit. And they felt that this kind of a regime did not give opportunity and dignity to them. And this is what led to Yanukovych's you know, being uh, forced to flee Ukraine and this second attempt after the Orange Revolution to create a democratic uh, country, all right? So this is the basic, you know, I think that dignity actually lies at the basis, uh, as a basis of liberal democracies. We give our citizens dignity by giving them rights. They have the right to speak, to associate, to believe in what you know, religious belief they want, and they have the right to participate in a political system, in a democratic uh, political system. The trouble is that this kind of universal dignity, which is really the basis of kind of modern liberalism, uh, 
uh, is just not satisfying for people after a while. I mean, it's bad when you live in an authoritarian regime under Mubarak or Ben Ali or whatever, but over time you begin to take you know, that basic recognition as a generic human being uh, for granted and you want other forms of recognition. And so recognition takes these very specific forms. The first major form it took in the 19th century following the French Revolution was nationalism. So a nationalist, what does a nationalist want? A nationalist says, I am part of a cultural group united usually by language. We don't have our own representation as an independent country. So if you're Serbia buried in either the Ottoman or the Austro-Hungarian empires, you want a separate uh, independent Serbia. And this kind of force is what really drove the First and Second uh, World Wars is people seeking recognition not as generic human beings in a liberal society, but as members of specific ethno-linguistic groups uh, demanding recognition uh, as such. And needless to say, this did not lead to good results in the first half of the 20th century. The other form, I think, that it takes in uh, contemporary life is certain forms of radical Islamism. Uh, when he was 13 years old, Osama bin Laden uh, came crying into his parents' uh, room saying, you know, he had just watched a show about the mistreatment of Palestinians and other Muslims around the world. Uh, he felt that Muslims were being disrespected, uh, you know, attacked, uh, disregarded, and in a sense that created the psychological con conditions for his wanting to give Muslims agency through terrorism, uh, essentially. And I think that a lot of the people, especially the young European Muslims, that have gone to fight on behalf of the Islamic State, it's not as if they necessarily had a religious conversion in which they suddenly are you know, pious people. I think a lot of them basically faced an identity problem, that they knew that they came from a different Muslim society. They didn't really like the traditions of their parents. They were not accepted in the European societies in which they settled. And all of a sudden, you know, you get Baghdadi or, you know, one of these Islamist preachers saying, you're a member of a great and dignified uh, ummah. Uh, that's who you are. We can tell you who you are. And that is the identity call, I think, that motivated a lot of people to go and fight on behalf uh, of the uh, Islamic State. All right, so this lies at the basis of a lot of global politics. Vladimir Putin feels that Russia was disrespected in the 1990s when it was weak. This allowed NATO to push up to its you know, borders and incorporate all these former parts of the Soviet Union. Xi Jinping talks about the 100 years of humiliation that China suffered at the hands of uh, the West. And so you know, a lot of geopolitics at that very high state level is driven by these sorts of resentments and these claims that are essentially claims about dignity. Now, this is also, in my view, related to the politics of liberal democracies, including those of the United States, in ways that actually lead to this funny convergence in the way that we think about, uh, uh, we think about ourselves. So in the 1960s, you had the beginning of a whole series of very important uh, social movements, beginning with the civil rights movement for African Americans, the feminist movement, the LGBT uh, rights movement, movement for the disabled, Native Americans, all of these groups had in common the fact that they were not recognized, that they were invisible to the rest of mainstream uh, American society. They did not get respect, uh, and they wanted it. And this was, you know, it was a necessary act of social justice to demand recognition as equal and full citizens. And so this was really the beginning. The word identity politics really doesn't get started until the 60s and 70s with the growth of these social movements. They're very important in terms of the overall justice of American society, but they developed in a way that shifted the agenda, particularly of uh, the left, both in the United States, I think also, I mean, there's a counterpart in Europe, because the left previously had been based on class, on economic issues. So, the big uh, issue for 20th century politics was a split between, uh, in, in Europe, it was a Marxist right, in, a, in, in the United States, in other Western European countries, it was a social democrat, I'm sorry, a, a, a left, and then a, 
right that was more in favor of economic freedom. And those were the basic polarities of 20th century politics. <clears throat> Increasingly, I think the left began to interpret injustice and marginalization in identity terms rather than in these broad class terms. And so it was the specific experiences of these marginalized groups that began to define you know, what uh, injustice meant. And that, again, is a perfectly legitimate way of understanding things. People have different lived experiences. So the kind of injustice that an African American in an inner city feels is very different from a professional woman in Hollywood or, or you know, whatnot. So uh, these are, uh, in fact, reflecting uh, real differences in experience. But as the, the, the movement developed, uh, you had uh, a shift in the, I guess, the moral valuation of these identities. Just to give you an example, just within the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King in the 1960s basically said, we want African Americans to be treated like other Americans. That's all we're asking for, that we're part of this larger democratic community and we want to have equal rights. Uh, when the black power movement started, you got a different kind of argument saying, no, actually, black people are not the same as white people. We've got our own values, we have our own culture, and we want to be respected as a cultural group rather than as individuals participating in a kind of uniform you know, society whose standards are set by white people. And that, I think, characterized the um, evolution of a lot of these particular groups built around particular identity. I'll just give you one little example uh, of this. So I'm treading on very dangerous territory here, so I, we'll, we'll see whether we can get through this all right. <laughs> but for example, I have a friend in Washington whose daughter was born deaf. And uh, she, um, when she was a teenager, she had uh, cochlear implants. And all of a sudden, she could hear well enough to actually become, and then she went to law school and now is actually an advocate for uh, deaf people. But there was actually a lot of hostility to just the idea that she should have this kind of an implant because the argument within you know, certain parts of the, uh, the deaf community was that you know, we have our own culture and you are undermining that because you're suggesting that you know, you're disabled in a way that, you know, and, and, and you can see how dignity politics plays into this, that you don't, wanna, you don't want to imply that anybody's worth is less than anybody else because of a physical uh, disability. And so this is kind of the way I think that politics has uh, evolved, and it is troubling for a couple of different reasons. So first, democratic societies, uh, of course, are pluralistic, and they have these differences in experience. But if they're going to be democratic communities, they also have to hold something in common. They have to have certain common values in order to discuss, to deliberate, to you know, work together in the context of uh, democratic uh, institutions. And when identity begins to stress you know, difference rather than shared experience, or if you say you've got these different lived experiences with no possibility of a common experience, then I think uh, you've got uh, a, a certain problem. Uh, there are other you know, manifestations of this. I think in terms of free speech, this has been discussed a lot. I think this is more a, an issue in certain universities and in the arts community and, and so forth, where uh, there is a view that has grown up that my, the way that I was born determines the way that I'm going to think. Uh, so that, you know, and that can be based on race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, gender orientation, uh, and so forth. And uh, that is a really ironic outcome because, in a sense, the struggle of modern liberalism was to get away from biological characteristics and say, actually, no, we're all equal human beings. We all have equal agency, and we're going to interact you know, as this kind of uh, universal you know, uh, uh, human agent. Uh, and instead, you're saying, well, no, actually, we're all divided into these groups that are determined by you know, how we're born, our religious traditions, our you know, biological condition. And that should influence the way that we think about politics, about culture, uh, about a lot of other issues. And so there's something, you know, there's something discordant with uh, 
a kind of understanding of, of liberal tradition, I think, that is involved in this sort of uh, identity uh, politics. Uh, the worst thing, I think, in a sense, is what it's done. So this, this, this understanding of identity that grew up on the left has now triggered uh, a, a corresponding movement on the right. And that's what Donald Trump represents. Uh, so Donald Trump, I think, uh, th this is the part that I think a lot of people don't quite understand. A lot of people voted for Donald Trump who are not, you know, workers in manufacturing uh, uh, plants that lost their jobs to China. You know, a lot of people are much better off uh, than that. Uh, they still supported him. Partly, you know, it was just kind of Republican partisanship. But partly, I think they were responding to this cultural complaint that the left had become so politically correct that you couldn't talk about you know, issues uh, honestly. And that's why he surprised everybody by calling Mexicans rapists, by the Hollywood access tape, you know, all of these things that should have sunk a normal politician didn't sink him. And deliberately so, because I think you know, a lot of his popularity lay in the fact that he was not politically correct. He could challenge you know, some of these nostrums of the way that you know, Americans had developed about talking uh, about themselves. And I think that that continues to be one of his uh, enduring sources of popularity. You know, I hate to say this, but I think he's basically a racist. And he's been perfectly happy to um, be racially divisive. He really got his start uh, in politics by uh, suggesting that President Obama was not born in the United States. Uh, he, you know, has been somewhat careful in making overtly racist statements, but I think it's pretty clear that you know he's perfectly happy to capitalize on the racial feelings that other Americans have towards each other, and that has been very bad. And so you now have an alt-right and a you know kind of set of white nationalist groups that had been, I think, pretty much marginalized over the period since the civil rights movement that are now uh, that are now coming back. So this is not a good situation. You know, this is not a good situation if both the left and the right see themselves in these increasingly biologized uh, identity categories. And you know, my own view is that we need to get back to the 20th century. <laughs> we sort of have to go back to class because actually, sociologically, class is the single most important dividing line between Americans right now. If you read, uh, you know, there's a couple of different books that build on the same kind of data. One comes from Charles Murray, his book on the white working class. The other one from Bob Putnam uh, at Harvard, you know, on the other side of the political spectrum. They present exactly the same sort of data that over the last 30 years, if you look at inequality, it is almost entirely class-based. That is to say, if you have uh, a university education or higher, you've done extremely well in this country. And if you have high school education or lower, uh, you've fallen off a cliff, basically, in terms of your income. And then in terms of you know, social status, I mean, 72,000, you know, latest CDC estimates, 72,000 Americans died the most recent year that they can you know, estimate this for uh, from this opioid uh, epidemic, most of whom are you know, rural, working class, white people. Uh, so the social catastrophe, in a certain sense, facing you know, poorly educated Americans, regardless of ethnicity or race or class or gender, uh, is, you know, is, is pretty horrific. And within all of the identity groups, you see the same kind of split, uh, you know, where African Americans that have higher educations are doing better, women, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, so I actually think that we've got a really big class problem in the United States. It is one that is probably best addressed uh, through, I think, classic social policy. Uh, I really like Obamacare. I think that that was an example of something that was not identity-based. It was really a policy meant to give health care to all Americans that didn't have it. And you know that kind of a focus should really be the focus of uh, the way that we try to reintegrate uh, our society. I think that national identity is important, but it has to be, and this is where, this is where Europe, uh, I think, has got, in a certain way, a bigger problem than the United States, because the United States, I think, by the period after the civil rights movement, had actually arrived at what I would call a, a civic identity. 
meaning that our identity was not based on ethnicity or race. It was based on belief in the Constitution, belief in the rule of law, belief in the principle of human equality embodied in the Declaration uh, of Independence. And so you could be naturalized as an American citizen from Guatemala or Korea or wherever. And the moment you took the naturalization oath, you could say, I'm an American, and nobody you know, would laugh at you uh, for saying that. That's what it means to have a civic uh, sense of national identity. And I thought that that had been an acquired, you know, something that we had really acquired painfully over you know, the 250 years of American history. And now that's really being challenged by certain people on the right that want to drag us backwards into a more ethnic or racial understanding of what it means uh, to be an American. In Europe, you've got, you know, you've got thicker cultures in each individual European country. And therefore, the, the task of integrating newcomers has been uh, a lot harder. So that's one issue. You've got to have a national identity that is open, that fits the de facto multicultural societies that we live in. But the second thing is you actually have to worry about assimilation or integration into that culture. Uh, and I think that's what's been missing from the immigration debate. I think that it is actually legitimate to worry about levels of immigration that are, that are at a level where you, know, you, you think you've got a real problem in actually integrating people in the next generation. And actually, in many uh, Western countries, you know, you've, you've kind of hit that uh, level. And the focus on the integrating part has not nearly been as strong, I think, uh, uh, as it needs to be. Uh, and uh, so I've got a lot of you know, very specific kinds of policy recommendations for how you do this. I think, for example, something like national service would be a good uh, way of getting people to recognize that they are citizens. So we in America love having rights. We think the government owes us a lot of stuff. Uh, we don't tend to think that we owe the government very much. Uh, and I think that the model of national service involved in you know, something like the, the draft uh, didn't lead to very good military outcomes, but it actually had a very important socially integrating function. And today, you know, the army is actually one of the few places in which Americans of different regions and backgrounds and you know, classes actually are forced to work together under stressful circumstances. You know, and uh, most of, uh, we've segregated ourselves by class to such an extent that that really doesn't happen in very many other uh, institutions. So maybe with that, I got a bunch of other ideas uh, you know, about how you deal with this kind of issue. But maybe we'll, we'll leave it there and open the floor for discussion. Thank you. As always, very insightful and I'm sure uh, stimulated a lot of questions. So I just ask that when the microphone comes to you, you introduce yourself. And try to keep your questions brief because I'm sure there'll be many. Well, we'll start over here. here you go. Well, wait, please wait till the microphone comes. Thank you. Rita House of High Frank. I really appreciated that overview. You missed one thing in my book, demography. I don't know whether you discuss it or not, but today's New York Times front page, there are more foreign born in the United States now than native born, which is, to my mind, a very profound development. Europe doesn't make babies, and they're hostile to immigration. What happens when societies die off for lack of people, even if they keep their ethnic identity? To me, the saving grace for America is immigration. Mm -hmm. and if we turn away from that, I don't know what the answer is. All the problems that are involved, nevertheless. But you have to face up to the fact yeah. of declining demographies. Yeah, well, actually, the countries that have the biggest problem with this are all in Asia because the lowest um, fertility rates are in Japan, South Korea, Singapore, you know, uh, and so forth. Singapore is a little different, but most of those other countries do not permit, uh, you know, wide, uh, widespread immigration, and they're going to have an even more severe problem. So, again, I think that Actually, the, the, the figure that the Times said, the number of foreign born in the United States is about 15% right now of the total population, which is about what it reached by the 1920s when the Reed-Johnson Act was, uh, you know, was passed, cutting, uh, cutting off immigration. I think, again, you can tolerate different levels depending on, what you're, the, depending on the way that you manage the policy. So, for example, Australia and Canada 
They have higher levels of foreign-born than the United States. They do not have populist movements the way we do. And part of that is that, you know, I think actually they don't have very much illegal uh, immigration. Uh, the Australians get blamed for putting all these migrants, you know, on, in Papua New Guinea and Nauru and so forth. But they're very careful to make sure that they are in control of the process. Both of them have skill, skills-based legal uh, immigration. And I think that a lot of the um, discomfort, so th this is a really important point. I, I think that there is a tendency to think that anyone that is a, you know, is questions the current immigration system is basically a racist or a xenophobe and just doesn't like all these foreign born people. I think there's a lot of reasons for thinking that we might not have the right system. And, and one of them has to do with the rate at which we can actually integrate people into the, uh, you know, into the broader uh, society. I think that was why Angela Merkel really made a really big mistake back in 2015, you know, by in theory just throwing the doors open completely because, you know, frankly, Germany does not have a great record in, you know, integrating people. Its native born population is declining. So, yes, they do need more bodies in there, but they will be successful only if they take people at a rate in which, you know, they can really become part of. You know, German society, and you know, I, 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 so I think that it's it's legitimate to you know consider factors like that, uh, uh, and not just think about you know numbers. Uh, Rob Judson, Griffin Capital. Thank you very much for your presentation. I read your article in Foreign Affairs, and was particularly impressed. Not only by the breadth of what you you had to say, but the practical policy solutions that you referred to. Could you share with us some of the other ones in, in addition to uh, national service? Thank well, you. so most uh, important issue is basically immigration, comprehensive immigration reform. So the path towards that has been on the, ta <coughs> on the table since the 1980s. Uh, essentially, you know, you've got an undocumented population of 11, 12 million people in this country, uh, you need to have a political trade-off in which you, you credibly promise future enforcement of existing immigration laws in return for a path to citizenship for those undocumented. It's a complicated policy issue because you want to give priority that you know, to people that came legally, that have been here a long time, that have proven that they're you know, successful productive members of American society, uh, and you've got a very clogged immigration system that, that processes them. So there's a lot of moving parts there. But that's been the basic, you know, that, that's, that was the basis of IRCA, the, the immigration reform in 1986. It's the basis of what the Bush administration tried to do. The problem is our current blocked political system where both the left and the right, you know, conspire to make this trade not possible. So. On the right, you know, there's obviously this hardcore of anti-immigration people that will simply not accept legalization in any way, shape, or form. But also on the, you know, on the left, there are people that just don't think that enforcement is an important issue. Uh, and I think both of those positions are wrong. I mean, so in other words, what you need is DACA, but not just for children, right? You need DACA for the parents as well. I mean, the parents have been in the country for 15 years, you know, working as a busboy or a maid or something, why shouldn't they, you know, also have a path towards citizenship? So, so that's the theoretical solution. The big political problem is how, how the hell you get there, given the fact that, you know, the, the two poles of the, you know, the fight have a veto over the, the respective part they don't want. But that's, you know, I think that's clearly the goal that you need to work your way towards. Thank you. My name is Eve Peterson. I'm uh, the ambassador of Denmark to uh, the UN. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you very much for the, uh, uh, the, the presentation. Just, just two questions. You pointed to reintroducing classic social policies uh, as, as, as one of uh, the instruments. Coming from Denmark, uh, yeah, where we got, have based, <laughs> yeah. based our welfare state on that, Sweden as well and so on. But we actually also see these uh, tendencies. I mean, you mentioned yourself the election. Uh, in Sweden uh, uh, last week. So the question is, could you elaborate a little bit on 
you know, and it, what 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 do you see, and, and how should should how should they be adjusted in in, in any way? Mm -hmm. So uh, if 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 we have to pursue that, I think we are uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. And there's a second question is working in the UN. It's 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 tempting to ask where do you see international cooperation uh, in this? Uh, you know, the UN since. It was established, uh, stands for an international normative framework in a number of areas, in particular human rights and so on. Uh, but we also see now, uh, 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 in particular from the US, but also from others, mm -hmm. uh, kind of retrenchment from uh, international uh, cooperation. Um, so where do you see that as, as part of this, um, you know, how we somehow make a, uh, adjust for the uh, things of relevance? Uh, yeah. So uh, you're right that in continental Europe, you've got a very different situation. So as far as I'm concerned, Americans have been brain dead about social policy for 30 years, right? <laughs> that after the Great Society, we said all that failed, and we're not going to really take that seriously anymore until you got to the Affordable Care Act, which I think was really a big milestone uh, in terms of actually trying to do something to, you know, having the government do something to improve social equality. That's obviously not the problem. Uh, in Scandinavia. I think in Scandinavia you have kind of the opposite problem, that a lot of the opposition to immigration is due to people thinking that immigrants are going to take these welfare state benefits without paying, you know, into the tax system, uh, and they're going to make it non-viable for the rest of the society. And so, in a sense, the question then is really this question of integration, about making sure that immigrants have jobs, that they seem to be you know, productive members of the society and that they're perceived that way by, you know, the mainstream uh, uh, native-born population. Uh, so, you know, how that's done is, is very complicated. We had a nice uh, uh, <laughs> conference in, when I was a visiting professor at Aarhus uh, on the question of national identity. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that European identities are just thicker than American identity. And so, that problem of integration is, 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 uh, uh, is harder. So on the question of the United Nations, uh, it's, a, it's a, you know, we're at this peculiar point where uh, there's obviously been this big backlash against um, certain forms of globalization driven by some of these institutions. Now, let me just begin by saying, of course, they're necessary. You know, you, you have a de facto globalized world, it needs to be managed, so you need this whole dense layer of international organizations. A lot of them are very specialized in, you know, sanitary and phytosanitary regulation, air traffic control, you know, uh, uh, all the ISO, you know, agreements and so forth. Um, I think that the universal ones, like the United Nations itself, have got real problems because you don't have a fundamental agreement on you know, first principles uh, of government and therefore cooperation has been very difficult. But there is this problem that I think has grown up in terms of, especially in terms of the international human rights regime that has a problem with accountability. So for example, in Europe, the rights of refugees is really not, people blame the, the EU but actually a lot of the expansion of those refugee rights has come through the European Court of Human Rights, uh, at, which was not an EU institution at all. It's really an you know, outgrowth of the Council of Europe. Uh, and, you know, people, so you get this situation in which you cannot deport uh, somebody that has been convicted of terrorism in your country because of the human rights conditions back in Palestine or wherever, you know, uh, uh, they're being sent back to. And people see this and they say, this is crazy. We never voted for this. You know, uh, this is something done by a completely unaccountable, you know, supranational institution. And so I think there needs to be some focus on, you know, on this kind of problem. I have no idea how to solve this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jean Valdarmed. I, I'm the ambassador of the European Union to the United Nations. So we're sticking for a moment in Europe. Uh, well, it's great to see you because like many of us, I've been quoting you in the last 20 years or so. And it's good finally to, to meet. Uh, and I can only congratulate for your previous books and looking forward to reading this one. Coming back to the issue of identity and the concept of identity. 
this is, a, as you said, a, a, a problem for you, an issue for you. And I think we had two, uh, three temptations. One, uh, one is to say it doesn't exist. We don't talk about it. It's taboo. We don't talk about that anymore because it's too complex and it raises another issue. So forget we put it aside. The second temptation is to say, let's build a European identity. And by doing that, gradually the national identity will, yeah. will phase out. And the third temptation is to say, let's only stick to national identities and, uh, and forget about the rest. Uh, so what the debate in Europe today and the struggle we are going through now is to try, in my way, and this is the concept I wanted to put forward, is a sort of multi-layered identity. No one loses, should not lose, and no one should attempt to take it away, a, a national identity. Why should we do that? No. But that's perfectly compatible with the regional identity. And in Europe, as you know, that is, there are strong regional realities and the European identity. And on top of that, a global identity because we live in a globalized. So at least I can think of four layers of identity that are, should be absolutely compatible. Uh, shouldn't we try to build on that? There's a big debate in Europe today about European sovereignty. It's the same kind of debate. You know, mm -hmm. you oppose national sovereignty, which doesn't make any sense anymore in today's world, but you try to build another concept of sovereignty. So these multi-layered sort of concepts, I think uh, at least that's what we're trying to do. And the very final point, because I hear a lot, and I've been ambassador to the US before being here in New York, so I, I hear a lot about division in Europe and the demise of Europe. You look at the opinion polls after Brexit and after Trump and after Crimea, uh, and you see a rise in support for European project mm -hmm. among young people. So I'm, I'm still hopeful. Yeah. Well, thank you. So um, I gave a lecture in Geneva about eight, nine years ago on this question of European identity. Uh, you know, I do think that the founders of the EU and then theorists like Jürgen Habermas and, you know, a lot of the theoreticians of, uh, of Europe uh, in the post-war period really did have the hope that a European identity would displace all of the national identities that had been responsible for all of the conflict in the 20, 20th century. And this was a, you know, this was a worthy uh, cause. But I think that given the institutional structure of the EU, it was really never possible to invest a lot of, you know, effort in that. Because what, what does it take to create an identity? You need to have a education system that teaches a consistent, you know, story about nationhood and what it means to be European and so forth. That remained under control of, you know, the member states. Uh, and as a result, um, you know, this idea of a post-national Europe was kind of a mirage. And I think it was brought home after September 11th when, you know, a lot of European countries discovered that they had minority populations that really had not been well integrated. And then all of a sudden, this issue of what does it mean to be a citizen and part of our community, you know, seemed to be a much more vivid uh, issue that nobody had really wanted to address. And that's the point at which I think a lot of European countries began to rethink their citizenship laws and, you know, citizenship requirements and so forth. I still think that it would be a great thing if you could actually convince people that they're all European, you know, that that's a really important emotional, you know, point of reference for them. Uh, I just don't think that it's, you know, terribly realistic right now. I mean, it may be that Europe has recovered a little bit, but, you know, I think the, the, the drivers of that are just, I don't see them institutionally in place. And so, therefore, I think the, you know, the, the, the state level, because it is the repository of the legitimate use of force that continues to be, you know, the domain of states, that's going to have to be, you know, the primary community to which people are going to feel emotionally, um, <coughs> uh, emotionally bound. So yeah, I mean, of course, we have all these identities at all these uh, different levels, but I think in the end, uh, you know, we're kind of drawn. I mean, you want to have people integrate into the largest identity possible that you know is is capable of maintaining a democratic set of values across that common cultural space. And right now, I still think that it's, you know, it, it still resides more at a nation state level than at this transnational level. But 
certainly, you know, all of the other ones are there as well, and you know, they should be cultivated. I think I wanted to come back to the United States. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim Trout, foreignpolicy.com. Uh, my sense is that your hopefulness about the possibility of returning to a better sense of identity in the United States rests upon a kind of golden age sense that we reach this equilibrium point in the aftermath of the civil rights movement where people accepted an idea of a kind of constitutional identity. But I wonder if that's true. It seems to me that, that the white backlash, of which we now see the kind of grandchild in the form of white nationalism, begins during the civil rights movement. And when the civil rights movement goes just from guaranteeing equal rights to actually giving the goods that the great society did, that's when the white backlash grows. And so is it really right that there was that moment back then that we need to reclaim? Or is it possible that race remains this unhealed wound in the United States that results both in the white nationalism and in the racial response to the white nationalism. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, race was always a factor. I think that uh, when Obama was first elected in 2008, Americans were celebrating prematurely that we've somehow arrived at this post-racial society. Uh, in retrospect, that really was not true. So all of those feelings, uh, unfortunately, remain. But, you know, the, the thing is that I don't think any society really gets beyond a lot of these sort of atavistic fears of other you know, people. But the whole point of having a set of social norms and that governs civil or civic discourse is to keep them suppressed. Uh, and certainly what's happened in the last couple of years is that the, you know, those, those restraints have just come off. Uh, so I really hate to think, you know, on high school playgrounds these days, what kids are, you know, willing to express uh, that they wouldn't have expressed, you know, five, ten years ago, simply because kind of at the highest levels of society, people are saying these really, you know, pretty insulting um, uh, things that, that, you know, they were not uh, allowed to say or, that, you know, where it was really looked down upon to say uh, previously. So that's the sense in which I think things really are different. The other thing is the framing. So if you're a white American 50 years ago, you didn't say to yourself, yeah, I'm a white person. You know, I'm part of this group called white people. Just say, I'm an American, right? Uh, and what's different, I think, about a lot of the ways that the white nationalists now understand their own situation, they say, well, we're part of this oppressed minority. You know, we're victims also because all of these other groups are claiming benefits, you know, and taking them away from us. And that's a framing that really is borrowed, I think, from the left-wing identity politics. And it's something new that, that really didn't exist previously. Uh, hi, uh, I'm George. Um, I have read the essay uh, in which you call for a kind of creedal nationalism, a kind of uh, nationalistic identification that's uh, de -bio unbiologized, less biology, more idea-oriented. Um, I, when I heard the gentleman over there at the table uh, talk about this sort of uh, identity at multiple levels, I, I, could I read just a few sentences from a, uh, this is the, the great British writer, uh, D.H. Lawrence, just a few sentences, his notion of identity written back in the 1920s, and I'd like to see your response to it. I am part of the sun as my eye is part of me, that I am part of the earth my feet know perfectly, and my blood is part of the sea. My soul knows that I am a part of the human race. My soul is an organic part of the great human soul, as my spirit is part of my nation. In my own very self, I am part of my family. There is nothing of me that is alone and absolute except my mind, and we shall find that the mind has no existence by itself. It is only the glitter of the sun on the surface of the waters. Um, OK, a kind of lyrical you know, expression of uh, exactly what he said about the, the possibilities of, of of a kind of nested identity, identifying deeply at various levels. Isn't that possible? I mean, we live in a more fluid age of gender and other things. Can't we uh, try to inculcate this sense of multiple fluid identities? So, yeah, obviously that's a reality. Uh, and it's something to be, you know, 
promoted uh, and so forth. But you got to think about politics, right? Because politics is about collective action. And collective action, for better or worse, in, uh, in a democratic society uh, takes place at a national and then all of the different, you know, sub-political levels uh, underneath that. And unless people, uh, you know, in a sense have a clear sense of belonging to this broader democratic community uh, where they share certain beliefs in the legitimacy of certain very specific kinds of political institutions, those institutions aren't going to, you know, work very well. So yeah, I mean, you can think I'm a child of the universe or of the sun or of, you know, whatever. Uh, but if you don't think, yeah, but I'm also an American that believes in the Constitution and in separation of powers and the importance of, you know, an independent judiciary, uh, and you don't have that pretty firmly in your mind, uh, you're not going to be able to organize to resist people that want to undermine that. Uh, so that's why I just think that you got to think, you know, yeah, sure, in, in cultural terms, we have all these different levels of identity. But politically, uh, the problem is that that sense of, um, especially in the United States, but in, you know, in other countries as well, like, you know, Italy, for example, uh, you have a, a degree of polarization where people really don't think of themselves as living in a common culture or a, you know, under a common set of values. And that's the thing that is not going to be overcome by, you know, these other multiple layers of identity. You got to talk about, you know, national identity and what you as a citizen uh, hold in common with fellow citizens. Uh <clears throat> Excuse me, Ron Berenbaum, I'd like to get back to demography because I think that's where this discussion started and I think it's extremely important. Uh, in the United States, we've experienced, or at least the phenomenon has been noted, uh, what we call the great sort, where the people who have what is called a creedal uh, commitment to the United States seem to be migrating to the cities and the people who have a blood and soil commitment remain in the small towns. Uh, at the same time, uh, the uh, smaller entities in American politics uh, retain a disproportional uh, uh, political power. I mean, North Dakota has two senators, so does California. Uh, so, and this phenomenon is not unique to the United States. I think it's in, uh, UK, where I spend a good deal of my time, uh, the only large city uh, that voted for Brexit by a narrow ma majority was Birmingham. So uh, I don't know how you overcome these demographic imbalances. I know that it's been on my mind. I recently read Middlemarch and the Great Reform Bill of yeah. 1832, where they tried to eliminate some of these disparities successfully. But now we seem to have regressed practically to the point that's depicted in that novel. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're correct uh, in saying that the single, uh, the single most powerful correlate with who votes for a populist party is population density. Uh, and so, and this is true uh, for many countries other than the United States. It was certainly true in Britain. But if you look at who votes for Viktor Orban, you know, it's not people living in Budapest. It's, it's you know, more rural voters, uh, who votes for Erdogan in Turkey, it's not people in Ankara or Istanbul, uh, you know, it's, it's more uh, uh, rural uh, kinds of voters. Um, so these are correlated, you know, population density is correlated with certain kinds of conservative uh, social values. And I think that um, that's, you know, that's just become a feature of, of the nature of politics. How you overcome that, uh, I think uh, you're not going to undo that sorting because a lot of that is driven by, you know, these structural factors having to do with education and access to services, a lot of things that are very, very hard to correct. I think that's why I think that what you need to do is work on the ideational understanding of identity so that uh, it doesn't become the case that, you know, one party simply 
sees itself as representing a certain set of values. And, and by the way, I don't think that it's the case that all the creedal people just live in big cities. You know, I think they've got a problem with that creedal understanding too. Uh, uh, I think actually a lot of people living in small towns, you know, still have this older sense of, you know, what America stands for that is, you know, pretty, you know, pretty healthy. So, Susan Gidolfin, we've been talking a lot about the Europeans. Let's talk about the Asians. Uh, recently, the Asian Americans have been complaining about discrimination in uh, uh, entering elite institutions like Harvard. Uh, even the term Asian really, as you know better than I, is quite varied. I mean, China has the largest population in the world and a growing uh, sense of identity. Uh, Japan has done so well, but has other uh, historic reasons, whatever. So uh, tell us what you think of Asian identity. Well, uh, as you just said, there yeah. isn't such a thing. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, most, especially in Northeast Asia, everybody is at their, each other's throats. So, uh, and in fact, it's interesting. Uh, Every time one of these comfort women issues comes up, I get a call from the consul generals of both Korea and Japan asking me to weigh in on this, you know, on this debate. And I say firmly but politely, no, thank you. I'm not, <laughs> not going to get involved in this. So there isn't really an Asian uh, identity. You know, there's a lot of different groups that come from a ge geographical place that we call Asia, but they've got very, very different uh, interests. And um, uh, how they vote is actually going to be a very interesting issue uh, over the years because the, um, you know, typically they've, they've tended to vote uh, for liberal causes and for democratic candidates. But I do think that this meritocracy issue is, you know, provides the Republicans with a you know, certain kind of opening, and so that's something that, you know, we're going to have to watch uh, uh, very carefully because they are the fastest growing, I mean, given that they're not a group, they're the fastest growing group, you know, of, uh, of new Americans in the country. Okay, Lace. Which party steps away from the identity competition first? I mean, because you could easily see the Democratic Party doubling down on cobbling together the identity groups, yeah. and this continues for a while. So who steps away from the You know, I don't first? know the answer to that, but that points to an important issue, and it's really one of the things that I wanted to get across in my book. I think the Democratic Party today, so let me just lay everything out on the table. I think it's super important to, that the Democrats win in November. I, I say that not as a partisan Democrat. I mean, I wasn't a Democrat up until I moved to California, but I, I, but I just think that you're not going to get any accountability and the checks and balances in the system are not going to work unless the Republicans suffer a pretty big electoral setback uh, beginning in, in the November election. Uh, so, you know, that's the starting point. But the Democrats in 2020 are going to have a really big problem because they've got this strategic choice to make about whether they double down on their existing uh, identity groups. Uh, there's a big temptation to do that because that's where all their activists live. And if you want to get voter turnout, you know, that's the strategy that you use and that's, you know, the way you can win elections. On the other hand, the reason that Trump won in the Electoral College was because he lost enough of these white uh, working class voters in Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Pennsylvania, that, you know, he, he won in the Electoral College. And I think it's actually very, so that's the choice, is whether you double down on, on the identity politics or whether you try to uh, adopt a position that welcomes back some of those white voters. I think it's a very bad situation if the Republican Party continues to go in the direction it's going in right now, it becomes a party of white Americans. And the Democratic Party becomes a party of minorities plus a few professional you know, white liberals. Uh, that's not a good situation for the country to be in. And I think, therefore, you know, my hope is that the Democrats choose the, you know, the broader 
the broadening strategy because among other things, even though you can win an election based on the identity groups, it's going to be hard to govern under those uh, circumstances. Once again, I have to thank you for giving us so much to think about. And thank you again for okay, coming. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a table set up. Okay. <laughs> Glad you were here.